I'm Helen Evans, and I'm the Byzantine curator at the Metropolitan Museum and the coordinating curator for the Philippe de Montebello exhibition that is still on upstairs, and we hope if you haven't seen it, you will see it. In the exhibition, we had the opportunity to show about 300 of the 84,000 objects that came into the museum during Philippe's tenure and are very proud of the works that are on display. What we were not able to show so well and what we hope that we will be able to do well today is to make people aware of the incredible importance to the museum of the conservators and research scientists who work, whose work on the objects in the exhibition, on the objects in the galleries, and whose publications on their work are critical to our understanding of science and art history as we know it today. Under Philippe, a um, series of state-of-the-art conservation labs were developed, and if you're interested in them, if you go to the Philippe de Montebello exhibition on our website, www.metmuseum.org, we have short films, webisodes that tour several of those galleries, and later this spring on PBS, there will be a hour-long film on the making of the Philippe de Montebello exhibition that will give you another opportunity to see the space in which these people work. What we have brought together today is a series of our leading uh, members of the conservation and research science staff, a very tiny number of the um, rather large number of people that do this in the museum, and I want to introduce them before they talk. First is Dick Stone, whom you heard speaking on ribbons in the film, and who is our senior museum conservator in the Department of Objects Conservation, and Michael Gallagher, whom you also saw in the film, talking more about process, who is at the Sherman Fairchild conservator in charge of the Department of Paintings Conservation. Florica Zaharia, beyond her, is the curator, uh, uh, conservator in charge of textile conservation, and then Marjorie Shelley, Sherman Fairchild, conservator in charge of the Department of Paper Conservation. Marco Leona, at the end, is not in charge of a conservation department. He is the David H. Koch scientist in charge of the museum's Department of Scientific Research, and he will give a slightly different perspective on all of this if we move quickly enough. If everybody will pick up your microphones, everybody gets one. We're not. We're going to go and let uh, around the group and let each person tell you something about what they do and their department does as they think it is of interest to you. And then we hope that at the end, we will have time for a brief period of question and answer, which is why the mics are set up in the uh, area, in the auditorium. And I'm going to start with Dick Stone because you saw him talking on ribbons, but his specialty is actually metal. Good afternoon, everybody. The object you see before you is an object the world has known for a very, very long time. In fact, it first comes into historical view in 1819, when it was purchased by the, the famous English esthete and character, William Beckford, for his mock medieval abbey, Fonthill Abbey. So this is the Fontil Ewer. And what you see is a smoky quartz ewer carved out of the, a single piece of rock crystal mounted in an elaborate gold mount with a foot and a handle. And of course, the handle is in the shape of a dragon. And dragons form the major motif for the base. What I really want to talk about is that, as you've seen from the film, what we largely do with objects is look at them. Now, that sounds like a trivial occupation, but it's not. A curator can probably tell you more about an object by looking at it than a thousand other people could tell you by smelling it, touching it, and analyzing it. You, you have it. Well. One of the issues in acquiring a work of art is its quality. The other issue is, is it 
what it seems to be. Now, of course, everybody knows about fakes. But the question about fakes is that really, most fakes are really quite easily distinguishable by a, a curator's stylistic knowledge. There are some, however, which are so well made and so ingenious that they not only deceive a contemporary curator, they've been conceiving the curators for hundreds of years. Such is the case with the Fonthill Ewer. The Ewer, the metal parts, are all made out of gold. And the gold has been fire enameled, and it has been set with over 200, over 200 diamonds. Here's one of them over here. So this is a very, very deluxe object. And as I, as I said, when we looked at it, we said, well, this is obviously an object of importance. We got it from the gift of the Linsky family. It came into the museum in 1982. But even back then, there were already misgivings about, well, does the gold work and the crystal really go together? Now, the crystal, we could be pretty sure, was done by a family of crystal engravers, the Miseroni, probably in Prague around 1680. The question is the gold work. Now, when I say looking at an object, it's more than simply looking at an object. Frequently, you have to take it apart. And the interesting thing about this particular object is it was very easy to take apart because it was all assembled with screws and nuts and bolts from cast elements. Now, the weight of the gold in this object was immediately something that made us suspicious because of the fact that gold is always expensive and people usually try to make gold go as far as it can go and still perform its structural functions. Casting gold is usually reserved only for very deluxe objects and then for objects, parts of those objects which have severe structural stresses, like the handle. Now, stylistically, this is a, an exceedingly attractive object granted in a very, very how should we say, grotesque style? Could I have the next? No. Oh. On your left, there is the head of the dragon on the candle, on the, the, the handle, and on the right, where the handle joins the body of the ewer. Now, I think you could immediately see that these are intensely, how should we say, exciting images, even though they push beyond what we would ex normally accept as being, quote unquote, the simply pretty. An amusing thing is, is that the full face figure apparently is quite close to several Chinese objects, interestingly, of the late, entry, late 18th century, the Qianlong period, when was the first time when Chinese art objects started to enter into Europe. Well, I will make a long story short. After we disassembled, disassembled this object, I decided to sit down and measure the object, and I discovered something very interesting. All the nuts and bolts, all the screw holes, all the hidden internal parts were to metric measure. Now that certainly makes one suspicious. 
considering that the metric system was only really promulgated in 1799, and it was slow of adaptation, although the members of the court of Napoleon were very, very quick to be with it. On the left, you see how the base was assembled and how it was assembled with all these metric screws and bolts. Stylistically, this object is a hybrid. It combines late Renaissance, very late Renaissance motifs, especially French Renaissance goldsmiths work of the early 17th century, which is very late in the manner uh, Renaissance mannerist style, with actually motifs taken from contemporary late 18th century Chinese sources. Now, what is especially strange about it is, is that no one, but absolutely no one, was doing anything like this at this time. The object is unquestionably French. I won't go into all the technical reasons, but it was made as a fake because it bears no hallmarks, and it was strictly forbidden, both in France and in England, to utter works of art, gold and silver, without bearing hallmarks. And on the right is a typical piece of Napoleonic silver, a soup tureen, which was made for Napoleon's sister. And indeed, it's a metric measure. And all the decoration, the frieze that runs around it, the, the top knob of the handle with the figures, the two side handles are all bolted on with nuts and bolts exactly the way the fontelure is put together. Well, this is a fake in the sense that it was intended to deceive. However, one of the things about fakes that one must always remember is fakes are still works of art. Now, most of them aren't very interesting art, but this is an exceedingly interesting piece of art because it is probably one of the very earliest examples of Renaissance revival in the Romantic style in the 19th century. Actually, this object, for reasons we won't go into, had to be made somewhere between 1808 and 1819, which in itself makes it a fascinating essay in the nascence of an entire new direction from the neoclassicism and the severity of the Ampere style to the burgeoning romanticism that by the third decade of the 19th century would be very obvious. Thank you. Michael is the person that you heard explaining the process in and out of the film of how we do the acquisition meeting, and now he's going to talk to you about the process of European painting conservation. Good afternoon. Is this mic on? I don't think it is. Oh, it is now. Thank you. Good afternoon. Um, you're looking at an image of the Sherman Fairchild Painting Conservation Center, which is actually currently undergoing refurbishment. This is the main studio of the center, and when a painting is being considered for acquisition, typically and ideally, it comes up here. We have excellent natural light, and as you've heard already today, examining an object, looking at it carefully in optimum conditions is a, a really important first step. We also have equipment for looking at things much cl more closely. For example, here with the stereo microscope, um, we undertake uh, X-radiography, and here my colleague Charlotte Hale is looking at a work with infrared, uh, a digital camera, uh, which will reveals the underdrawing in works of art. And to begin with, I just want to show you a, an example of a relatively recently acquired painting that uh, where infrared actually did reveal some very interesting things. Um, this is a painting by Edvard Gärtner, German artist of the 19th century. This is from 1836. 
and is the family of Mr. Westphal in the conservatory. It shows his wife um, at uh, some sort of afternoon, uh, I was gonna say afternoon tea, which is very English, afternoon coffee or hot chocolate probably with his daughters. It's a tiny little picture, it's only a few inches wide. Um, and Gertner is mainly famous for um, his uh, streetscapes of Berlin, where he records every detail of the street with a sort of architect's precision, whereas this is this sort of tiny jewel-like interior um, with a, I, I find a sort of claustrophobia to it. It was in very, very, very good condition indeed. It was proposed by the curator uh, Sabina Revolt in the um, 19th century modern contemporary department. And certainly there was no um, work needed on this and there were no question in our minds about um, the, the, both the quality of the object and its condition. But it was, um, we knew from the beginning it would be very interesting to examine this in infrared. And my colleague Charlotte Hale um, captured this uh, next image, which is uh, a, a, the same detail um, with the underdrawing. That's what is under the painting. And I, we, we just found it very compelling, this amazing uh, perspectival drawing um, that, that is so typical of his street scenes that he even applied to a, a tiny interior like this with the drum of the, of the table, the little girl's head tipped into a different position. Um, so in a sense, it was uh, a document that could be uh, presented to the trustees at the acquisitions meeting, which um, amplified the, the qualities of the picture. Um, as well as uh, examination in this sense, um, when, we, when we look at a work of art, um, it's, it's very important we give a very objective um, and clear uh, description of the condition of that work of art, its problems and so on. But that, um, that description, that, that, those condition issues, have to be taken in the context of a number of other things. The um, needs of the collection, d d does a work of art, does a in my case with paintings, uh, do we have works by that artist? Um, the rarity of the, of the object versus its condition. And finally, as you've heard again today, um, perhaps the most important thing, the quality. And I wanted to show you a painting that was acquired very, very recently indeed. Um, it was acquired in, in, in October of last year. And it was, in a sense, uh, one of Philippe de Montebello's last acquisitions in, in the area of European paintings. Um, this is by the, the French artist working in Italy, Valentin de Boulogne. It's a painting dating from about um, uh, 1626. Um, when this came to the studio, um, it, we examined it for a long time, and then Keith Christensen was the curator proposing this, and Philippe was invited down to see it, and I remember he came in and he sat in front of the picture in silence for a while, and Keith and I waited nervously nearby, and then after a few minutes' silence, he, he raised his arms and said, it is a met picture, we have to have it. And um, it was very compelling, this uh, immediate response. But this picture was, um, seemed so important because, and again, it, it has condition issues, and I'm going to take you through some of those. But the things that were, were, were uh, to go back over those points again, Keith Christensen for a long time had identified a gap in the collection that, um, of, of not having a painting by Valentin. Um, it's his only secular single figure composition, the flute player, player, his other single figures of, of saints, and it's of really incredible quality, but it had condition issues. Um, the issues are very typical for the artist. He paints on a dark colored ground, and the, the, the dark colored, the ground is the, the preparatory layer put over the entire canvas, and his dark paint layers become, as they age, more transparent. That dark layer of ground becomes uh, more prominent. And the dark paint layers seem to be particularly susceptible to abrasion in later injudicious cleaning. And you see this again and again in paintings by the artist. So though we saw those problems in this picture, they were um, entirely expected for the artist. Um, the picture had been cleaned in the past uh, rather harshly, on, uh, oddly, on the right side of the, of the composition. Um, uh, I, I find it a little difficult to see from here, but I hope you can see and sense that the, the ground 
is visible here in an area um, it shouldn't be. But despite those, those as I say, typical condition problems, um, the, the, the quality of the picture was, was, was inescapable. And um, one of the, the essential things we must do, uh, as well as describing those condition issues um, as accurately as we can to the trustees and putting them into the context, which is crucial that, the, that we work together with the curators for that, um, is, is to also talk about the prognosis for treatment and for, in the case of a painting, if it is treated, how will it change? What will its appearance be? So I just want to briefly, in the next few slides, take you through the treatment of this picture, um, which was described um, and predicted, in a sense, in, in the condition report that went to the trustees at the acquisitions meeting. Um, for example, here in the hand, um, you can see or maybe you can't see. Oh, sorry. The, um, let me go back. This is the hand before uh, cleaning. Um, what you're seeing up here is uh, discolored retouching, quite broad and crude, over um, the small damages. The same area in ultraviolet light with the fluorescing old varnish and again, much more clear and easy to see the, these broad retouchings. Um, just going back to that area so you can see it. And then after cleaning, and as you, can, as you see there, all of this stuff up here was really excessive. Um, there was, it covered very, very little damage indeed. And some of the, uh, in, in terms of painting conservation, we are often trying to second guess uh, when something's been very broadly overpainted how, how much is, is uh, covering a real problem and how much was just very crudely applied, um, sloppily dealt with restoration. Um, and that's the same area after cleaning and retouching. Um, same with the head before, um, we knew that there were problems in, in the area of the, uh, uh, around the cap, um, damage to this uh, medium rich color used in, in, the, in the black cap and in the ground. Um, that's after cleaning. Um, the picture is rather desaturated there. It doesn't have a varnish, but um, you, you can see these, these issues in, in the, on this side of the face. Um, and again, after restoration. And then the area of the um, sitter's left, uh, proper left arm, um, the, the, the discolored varnish rather hid um, this, the extent of the abrasion in the ground, um, but it was, it was clear that that was an issue and that was included in the description of the report, but again, that those were issues that were common to the artist and that could be resolved by um, proper cleaning and uh, restoration. After cleaning, um, a little more obvious there, this exposed ground, um, an area where the artist, um, there's a pentimento here, or a, what the, not actually really a pentimento, the, the, the hand overlaps onto the drapery that was painted at, um, at an earlier stage. And in, in the earlier cleaning process of, of possibly the 19th century, um, this has become rather worn and, and confusing. And then after the restoration process. And then just to take the last three of the, the overall sequence of um, before, after cleaning and after restoration, and that's how it's, uh, the picture appears now up in the galleries uh, of the French uh, 17th century galleries in European painting. And I think one of the things that is so essential when you have a picture that arrives for potential acquisition in a compromised state is both to describe what those issues are, for, um, the trustees um, are not conservation specialists, obviously, and we have to communicate what the, the issues are so they, they, ha they, they really have a clear understanding of what they're deciding on, but also to put those um, comments into the context of, as I say, is this typical for the artist and what is the prognosis for treatment? Because they have to understand whether through judicious treatment you can have a, a, a successful transformation and an, uh, an object which is as, as compelling and beautiful as this um, can join the collection. Thank you.
where Dick works with stone, Florica works with textiles, some quite, quite delicate as she's going to show you now. Good afternoon. Can't hear me. The condition, the quality, and certainly the authenticity of the art, um, of an art object, are very important elements to be considered for the acquisition process. The textile are no exception to this. The conservator role is therefore to participate in the acquisition process with our expertise, technical expertise, to identify the conditions and um, the technical characteristic of a specific textiles. The work begins immediately after the curatorial staff identify and propose a textile for acquisition. And in fact, as soon as the textile will come into museum, will be transferred to the Textile Conservatory, um, um, Textile Conservation Laboratory, where will be analyzed and um, the work will therefore start immediately. How do we proceed and what are we looking for? First of all, a visual examination will give us a brief estimation of the condition, of the quality, certainly, of the object. Those, um, this visual examination usually follow, is followed by in-depth um, analytical work performed with advanced analytical equipment, and the results should give us information related to the textile condition and its manufacture. Also should give us information related to the um, cultural and geographical origins, all this information being very important. For example, we know that in 16th century Europe, we will not find rami or banana fiber, as well as we know we will not find linen in Japan in the same time period where was this fiber, this plant was not cultivated. Therefore, all these details, we have to take them into consideration. The textiles are made of organic materials, and they were mostly made for a specific use. That means um, most of the textile deteriorate during their life, um, and therefore it's a very rare opportunity when a textile arrives for acquisition in impeccable condition. That was the case of those two panels 18th century French woven and embroidered silk. They were designed by uh, Jean de Mostin de Gourg, and they were woven in Lyon in the atelier of Camille Pernon. They were in um, extremely good condition. They were, they were commissioned for the um, Casita de Labrador uh, rural palace for Carlos IV of Spain. Apparently, they were never used for that purpose. And because of that, and because they have been stored in, in uh, good condition, we, they preserve fantastically their color and uh, their variety of materials. In this situation, before the uh, acquisition, the conservators were less concerned about um, identifying their, their um, condition issues. Rather, we concentrate on understanding their technical characteristics. Also, we um, thought a lot about the best preparation for display and their long-term preservation. We see uh, details of the embroidery on the central panel, which is exquisitely done and uh, very well preserved. Now, not, not all the um, um, textiles comes in this situation. I want to share with you a, going back a little bit, a few more details of the same embroideries. And uh, we can see a wonderful range of colors on this one. And I want to move with, um, um, to a next object that I want to share with you. One of the best textile acquired by the museum in the last decade is this tapestry, a 16th century Flemish tapestry made of silk and wool. 
very unusually well-preserved range of color for its age and for its quality. Most of the tapestry, most of the Flemish tapestry of these types are far more deteriorated. Also, not only the colors, but um, upon visual examination, the structure, the material seems to be in a very good condition. After an in-depth analytical work, we find out that the truth was a little bit different. The tapestry was damaged in the past and it has been restored. Um, we identify probably two types of restoration. One has been done um, at the beginning of the uh, 20th century, others in more recent years. What kind of damage did we find? Um, just a common reason for damage uh, that occurred in historic tapestry could be insect, could be fiber oxidation, um, inappropriate method of hanging, our tapestry being made of silk and wool, they are proteinic fiber, they are vulnerable to insect. The oxidation of the fiber occur when, uh, usually when the iron is used in the dyeing process. The hanging method, uh, yet another reason, in most of the tapestry were the metal ring that were attached to the top of, uh, um, upper part of the tapestry and the weight was unevenly distributed. The damage occurred exactly where the rings were attached. So all this contributed to um, several damages scattered throughout the tapestry. Therefore, we have to um, put our effort in analyzing the entire tapestry to determine how much was uh, previous damage, how well it's restored, what type of restoration, and how, um, how good the overall condition, how stable the overall condition of the tapestry is for the future. The early restoration was done with the early synthetic dyes and uh, they don't have a good reputation. Uh, they are fading um, in the light quite rapidly. Therefore, we have an example here. Let's see if I can point it out. Um, especially in the brown areas where um, they have been restored, they changed the color. Also, it was the case of the Fama, the letters uh, above the central figure. And um, usually you will see them in the pale orange color. Here we see the, the central figure after restoration. And um, the later restoration, the restoration done in the recent years was fairly well done. And um, it proved that it was stable and well integrated into the original. Therefore, yet the tapestry was damaged, but nothing out of ordinary. Most of the tapestry of this um, uh, type and um, um, of this age, they will be, um, they will have some sort of damages, most of them. Therefore, this was uh, for its rarity and for this wonderful condition, a wonderful um, purchase, piece to be purchased. We did that in 1998. After that, it was um, restored minimally, although in our textile conservation laboratory, and it was prepared for display. We um, support it, uh, reinforce it with, with straps and protect it with lining. We distribute its weight for um, hanging for, it, for display with a Velcro. And uh, it could be seen now in the Philippe de Montebello Ears exhibition. Thank you. Where Florica restores delicate fabrics, Marjorie um, is the museum's expert on works on paper, and she's going to take you through some of the related issues on paper. 
a few case studies um, uh, of more, not so much the issues of the conservation procedure, but the kinds of um, issues we're confronted with. The paper conservation department serves all the curatorial departments, and most of them are collecting some sort of paper-related material. It might be papyrus or palm leaf, but of course most of them are creating, uh, or um, collecting uh, prints and drawings or illuminated manuscripts. So the department has to um, do acquisition um, examinations and reports on hundreds of objects over the course of the year. And for this, as with the other speakers, we carry out research um, on the object, on their materials and technique, the process of deterioration that's characteristic for that type of object. Uh, most of the, um, the um, questions that we are confronted with deal with things such as um, determining if an object can be conserved. That is, if we could somehow bring some visual and structural integrity to the work of art. Um, there are also are issues of authenticity, um, attribution, and dating based on the materials and technique. And um, we carry out these procedures, as I mentioned, but of course we also rely on the scientific department to help us in the analysis of some of these um, questions. Uh, very frequently the questions are related to information gathering. We want to know the, about the purpose of the work of art or the context of which it's a part. And then, very important, are issues of, of um, presentation and housing, because these are very fragile works, and we want to be able to um, preserve them as, uh, in the best possible condition. So let's see. OK. This is when I first saw this drawing by Salviati. It looked very much like this. It was in a um, small French auction house. It was pressed between two pieces of glass and uh, the condition was terribly compromised. It was highly embrittled. There were patches and repairs, water stains, a lot of planar distortion, meaning it was terribly irregular. Even though it was pressed between two uh, sheets of glass, it was obvious that it had many damages. And the real issue here was determining whether or not this could be conserved and whether it could be conserved to still reveal it to be a working drawing. Um, I'll tell you a little bit more about that then. Uh, but the decision had to be made at that time. It wasn't a situation where the object could be brought to the museum. Um, I'll show you what the, uh, this is a two-sided cartoon. Well, you can see this, the, on one side is St. John um, the Evangelist, and then on the other side is St. Mark, visible by their attributes, the lion and the eagle. Um, this was a very, even though it was terribly compromised, I did know it was an extremely important drawing. It was one of the very few drawings of this type by Salviati, and it was also the only known double-sided cartoon. A cartoon is a, double, is a drawing that's made life-size, meaning the size of the final composition, which could be a fresco or a painting. In this case, it's a painting, and what made this one unique is that the contour lines are incised. They were incised with a stylus, so the artist um, held this up to the wet plaster wall, and he went over the contours in order to provide a, an outline that would subsequently be painted. And this was felt by the curator to be a very um, important part of the, the composition, even though most of these lines were torn. We wanted to make sure that we preserve this as well as the creases in the drawing, because that too was part of the working process. So it was an interesting project working with the curator, Carmen Bombach, who is a, an expert in um, Renaissance um, materials in, in works on paper. I don't know why this is not going. For, okay. And um, this is the final result, where the, um, many of the stains were taken out, but a lot of the um, evidence of the purpose that this draw drawing served were retained. It also was a drawing that we had to um, consider uh, exhibiting where both the recto and the verso were visible, and um, we therefore keep this in its frame permanently, uh, so that both sides could be seen, but it's protected, and scholars can view it from the, uh, the back and the front. The uh, next drawing is um, also on view. It's by Gauguin. It's called The Artist's Portfolio, Pont Evan, um, 1894. And this, again, was something that I was asked to look at at auction. 
It was it's basically in good condition. There are obvious signs of wear and use, and we do like to preserve these things in, in works of art of this sort. And what was interesting about it, it did have some conservation problems, um, adhesive and tissue paper um, adhering to the surface, and some flaking paint, which is not an uncommon thing with an object that does get a, a lot of use. The, the paint um, tends to detach from the substrate, the binder dries out, but these were correctable problems. But the real issue in this case regarding conservation was um, information gathering. We were planning on doing an exhibition, The Lure of the Exotic, and uh, wanted to find out as much as possible about Gauguin's materials. A lot is known about his oil paintings, but he was very secretive about his works on paper, and we started to unravel what the secretiveness was all about in studying this. Even though, um, I should start out by saying there's a lot of myth associated with uh, Gauguin's materials. You know, he went to exotic lands from Brittany, Martinique, to the South Seas, and um, a lot of beliefs that he was making his own painting materials for his drawings. And what I discovered in the course of doing the research on this is that, in fact, what he used, and this is a very good example of it, was the most pedestrian of all materials. They weren't exotic at all. He primarily was relying on common office supplies. And this portfolio, which he embellished, you could see at the far left, he embellished with an inscription dedicated to his innkeeper, and it has a very elaborate emblem. He put on uh, leather straps. He put on shoe buttons, which one of the, the uh, textile conservators identified for us. The ribbons at the top and the bottom were um, dyed with modern aniline colors, another contribution of the textile conservators. We do have a lot of interchange, and we consult with one another when we have issues like this. Um, this was just his fabrication to make this look very, very elaborate and um, you know, very important. But what's interesting about the portfolio itself is that it's not one that's associated with um, an artist or a collector, as they would use to store their drawings, but it was a copy press. It was the type of, of um, tool or, or device equipment used at the end of the 19th century to make multiple copies of letters. The letters were written on the finest paper, uh, business correspondence, and the ink was an aniline ink. It, they, the one letter with the, uh, that was written would be inserted in this portfolio with multiple um, layers of this very thin paper and a slightly dampened blotter and the folder would be closed so the ink would transfer through and you would end up with multiple copies, much like a mimeograph machine that was just emerging at that time as well. And um, Gauguin used this type of folder for his drawing. He also used these similar papers that were commonly used in offices for his very elaborate dynamic wood blocks and he used this type of ink for various of his compositions. Um, there are many other instances where we found that this was what he was um, utilizing. What was also interesting is that he probably was attracted to this um, portfolio because of the type of interior paper, which is something called millboard, which was very commonly used in letterpress technology. And this paper um, was highly absorbent and therefore absorbed the paint and left it very matte. It was a primitivizing effect that he was seeking at this time. Um, in adding to his desire to use modern materials, the um, science department analyzed the, the colors that he used here, and they each turned out to be modern, commercially available colors, zinc white, um, emerald green, colors of that sort, which we learned corresponded with the colors that he was using in his paintings, and in fact were the same colors that he had used from the beginning of his production until his death. And obviously, since he was always under great financial hardship, this type of material was a very good adaptation for his um, circumstances. Another drawing uh, reflects a different aspect of what we're often called upon to do. When this drawing by Jacopo Lagazzi was brought to me, everything about its provenance seemed fine, and it was just seeming initially to be a very rote um, example of doing a, a condition report and so forth. But as I looked at it and looked into it, 
I realized that something was not quite right with it. This was a botanical drawing, and botanical drawings were scientific studies meant to be very specific. And this vellum support was green. And that was, there really were no precedents. We couldn't find anything that corresponded to it. So I looked into the methods that were used in the 16th century and earlier for dyeing parchment, just on the outside possibility that this was an exception to the rule. And this was a, an instance where Lagazzi used a colored um, background. And I, sh uh, well, I'll get to that in a second. There was no evidence this had been coated with uh, a paintbrush or that it had been dipped in a color, which were the traditional means of, of uh, dyeing uh, uh, parchment. And in examining the drawing further, it became evident that although there were many details in it and um, the, the drawing itself was very finely articulated, that this clearly had been subject to some sort of mishap, some sort of flood or a tremendous amount of moisture and probably that this had happened in the course of the working process, not something that happened at the end. There did not seem to be anything that was reworked. So even though um, it did not correspond to the very beautiful drawings by Lagazzi of this sort in the Uffizi, it was still felt that we should acquire it because it was one of the rare examples of this drawing or the only example of a drawing of this sort by this artist that had ever come on the market. All the rest of them were in the Uffizi. And because of its rarity, even though the condition was not perfect, we went ahead with the acquisition. Let's see. Um, let me go back to this. These two drawings um, are not really the subject of what I want to talk about, but are very important because they were the basis of making a comparison. The drawing that is the subject, I cannot show because we never acquired it. It was purchased by a private individual. But um, this is uh, by Joris Hofnagel, an artist who was active about 1600 and is considered the precursor of 17th century Dutch uh, still life painting. Uh, he had a particular very uh, complex philosophical belief that entailed the uh, awe-inspiring quality of insects and the you know, creatures of the earth and how they are no different than the, the lofty and the noble in life. And they were drawings that were made for Kunstkameras. He was an artist who worked for Rudolf of Bavaria. Well, a drawing, this one was um, given to the museum in the 1960s, and although it's very interesting, it was never felt to be a prime example of his work because it's abraded, and the colors in the background were faded, and the curator and members of the drawings department felt they would really like to have an outstanding example of such an important artist's work. Also, we're building a collection of northern drawings, so it made perfect sense to have one of a, a good example of uh, Hofnagel's works in our collection. So I was asked to go down to look at a drawing um, purported to be by Hofnagel at one of the auction houses in New York. And all I could do was take a magnifying loop with me, and I really could not gain very much information from that. This, uh, the drawing up at auction had been accepted by almost every scholar, every expert, as being an authentic uh, Hofnagel. And the expert at the auction house was very kind, and he said he would you know, bring it up here. He came with the drawing, and the only problem was that I had less than two hours to make an assessment, and it was on the weekend, so I didn't even have the assistance of a scientist to analyze any of the colors. So I had to look at the drawing, using this as my basis of comparison, as well as some other things I was familiar with, look at the way in which the pigments were ground. And that was the fly and the ointment. All the motifs were perfect. It was a drawing somewhat like this. But the black had a very lugubrious quality. The blue was coarsely ground. The shell gold, which is what you see around the cartouche, was, um, it was very finely dispersed. It did not have the quality of shell gold of that era. And the most distressing thing is the brush stroke in the um, drawing from the auction house was not very refined. They were individual lines that were very labored. It really looked as if it was something that was copied. 
and I deduced that this composition was a pastiche, despite the objections of, of uh, or you know, obviously the attributions of so many scholars. And I discussed this with the curator. We continued to do some research on it, but then decided that we would abandon the other drawing, that the um, materials really were indicative that it was not the kind of drawing we really wanted in the collection. But the happy ending to it, and it was kind of disappointing, the happy ending to it was that only a few years later, another drawing by Hofnagel came on the market, and this, the attribution was secure. It's a drawing that he dedicated to his mother on her 70th birthday. The provenance was secure, and by that time, um, I had become very familiar with the artist's working process and the materials he was using. So um, it was an interesting um, uh, combination of things. We need to go with Marco. We'll go on. Okay, Marco. Thank you. I'm okay with this one. What, um, so I don't have much to show uh, because uh, I don't have much to say at these meetings. Uh, <laughs> honestly, my colleagues uh, whom you've uh, listened to have uh, all uh, advanced degrees and training in art history, and, and, and so they have a very uh, good idea of what comes around and is discussed at the um, acquisition meetings. I'm a scientist, and I can tell you that the acquisition meeting at the Metropolitan Museum of Art is probably the strangest place for a scientist to be at. Um, so after telling you that I don't know anything about what I'm what, what's talked about, uh, if I start with this image, you'll have the strange idea that I know about uh, expensive ladies' underwear. <laughs> and underwear and expensive go together, not ladies. But um, that's a funny thing, because it was in the video that you saw, uh, and it's one of the examples I picked, and more to tell you how strange it is to be working in a museum than to talk about this piece. Um, the one thing that you saw in that video is that Dick, uh, gave a very good and, and I think the best explanation about the condition of this piece and why we thought it was what it was uh, uh, described as. What you didn't see in the video is that we all look at each other and say to each other, how does Dick know these things? Because suddenly he's also an expert on underwear. And I think we all add that. <laughs> it was, you know, it was masterful. He came up and said, like, no, the, the weave looks good. Uh, the, the, the cutting of the width, the, the, the stitching, uh, the little holes that you don't see here, uh, the wear, the wear pattern, which is a very important thing, and, and none of, my colleagues do all that. They examine an object, and they really uh, build a mental history of its creation and its, uh, its handling and, and exhibition, conservation, uh, use history. But, uh, but then when everybody is, uh, sort of distressed and they try to get the last uh, bit of evidence that would turn the tables and, and make sure that it is real or fake, um, they come to us, um, maybe not, not necessarily because we have the answer, because I think that really the answer is there where, where the conservator's version. So we try to do dye analysis. This, you see the, the fabric is uh, crimson, uh, and uh, and you can tell something with dye analysis. There's a pretty uh, uh, well-known evolution of the dyes used in, uh, in the history of textile fabrication. And, um, and so we were asked to do the analysis uh, with, the usual, with, the, with the usual constraint for scientists, which is um, if you can do it without taking anything off, uh, that's, that's the best thing. But if you really must, it should be absolutely invisible, which is what we do here, and I'll show you how. Uh, now, there's a, there's a pitfall to that, and, and that's also the reason why um, we don't have much to say at the meetings, because when we find something incredibly interesting about a piece, that piece doesn't make it to the meeting, because it generally means the color, uh, the pigment, the material, was not the right one for what we expected, so that that object is taken out of consideration. If we find something, if we find that a piece has all the right material in it, it doesn't necessarily make it authentic. Uh, it may add to that. 
Um, and so that's what we found in this case. Uh, we actually had two types of analysis done. One is a more traditional analysis called um, high performance liquid chromatography that showed us that all of the ribbons that you see there are uh, dyed, I think, with cochineal crimson, which was, and, and Brazil wood, which were two natural dyes that would have been used uh, by default uh, in the 18th century. That's the material uh, of choice for that type. But in some uh, areas uh, where we had uh, uh, stitching threads that had put together the ribbons, we found um, using uh, a new technique that we actually developed here, um, late uh, 19th century dyes. So um, um, a crimson uh, thread that had been dyed uh, for sure after 1880, 1890. And paradoxically, that was uh, a good indication because it sort of alluded to an history of views and if you want mending and, well, not using, but mending and restoration of this piece. This piece had been taken care of. Of course, it would not have made it for 150 without needing uh, to be restitched in places. And the fact that we found uh, a synthetic dye in the stitching thread, but not in the original ribbon, was uh, very much in keeping with what was observed in the, um, in the kind of uh, wear of the material and also in, in the construction of the ribs. So uh, in, that was one of the rare cases in which the scientific evidence, uh, instead of damning something, makes it more, uh, more acceptable. The, the key to the analysis is doing all this work without um, defacing the object with, with the most microscopic sample. So um, that's how we do it. For instance, in this little capsule contains um, the sample that's going to be treated. Don't go looking for the sample because you can't see it in there. That's the whole point of the uh, exercise. We, I'm, I'm here looking at the microscope to, to put it in here and, and make sure that it stays there. And when all is said and done, the sample is treated, this is uh, about 500 times magnified, a little uh, thread, a little fiber from a thread, which in this case, using a, a, a new technique, has little nanoparticles of silver that we deposit on it, and then we hit them with a laser beam, much like this. And, and that tells us what the, um, we, we get a fingerprint for the, for the textile dye. But, uh, there's another side to uh, the acquisition meeting and also to our um, interactions with the director and the curators. And it's the fact that we often speak two languages and, and we have to try to reconcile it. So another example that you've seen uh, in, the, in the video is coming up. And, uh, and again, we didn't have much to say about this. We say the one uh, thing, this is a jade disc, I think it's possibly Western Han, and it had been uh, examined by my colleagues in conservation and of course by the art historians where everybody said um, it looks exactly like what you would expect from a piece of this uh, period from the front of point, stylistic point of view. Um, all of the conservators looking um, high magnification, using high magnification microscopy were able to see that there were no traces of modern tools and that the working uh, uh, method appeared to be the same um, one that um, a Chinese uh, craftsman would have used. And, and we did the analysis of the stone, and it turned out that it was the type of jade that is used um, in China. And we wrote, um, I think, a three-page report where we detail, uh, simply all, uh, only from the scientific point of view, what we did, the uh, X-ray, diffraction technique, and we listed all the data, and in the last line, line it said, and it's nephrite jade, which is what is found in China. And at the meeting, Philippe called me up and said, and do I have to read a three-page report and go through all of it to see in the last line that this is the jade found in China? <laughs> and I say, well, this is the jade found in China. But uh, Sometimes, it, and this is not to say that to us it's important to tell you exactly the scientific name of the jade, um, but somehow that in the, in the process, that kind of information, uh, we, we never thought that he would have focused on that. We thought that all of the information 
relayed by the art historical art historians and the conservation colleague would have been what had made attracted his attention. And this type of um, strange uh, interaction with Philippe uh, and keeps coming up, and, and we, have a, we have a wonderful relation with him, and he's been very supportive, but always you have to um, sort of play this uh, tug of war between, between the science and, and, and his vision of a museum, and granted the museum is a better place with him running it than if I were or had been in his place. So um, another little, the final example is our wonderful gallery for um, oceanic pieces. This has nothing to do with the exhibition, but I think it has a lot to do with how we run things here. It's a wonderful space, and um, it's beautiful because of the light that you see uh, in it, and of course, beautiful because of the pieces that are shown there. We just redid it, uh, we renovated it, we changed the, the curtains, we changed the space. Now you can see uh, hanging from the roof the beautiful uh, coma ceiling. It's, it's, it's actually much more beautiful than it was before. Um, then we had the idea to go in and um, check the light levels because, of course, it's south-facing um, uh, curtain wall, a glass wall. So especially in the winter, we're getting really high light levels, and um, conservators and scientists in museums are really against light because light is not good for the art. Unfortunately, you need it to um, look at the objects and to see where you're going. You also need the right quality of um, light. Um, and uh, so we were not happy. We thought that some, in, in some days we could reach dangerous light levels for the art. Uh, Philippe uh, begrudgingly accepted to meet with us to look at the situation and see if we could uh, find some remedy. And uh, when we set the uh, meeting, which had to take place in the galleries, I actually looked at the weather report for the two weeks ahead and found a day that would have to be um, a completely cloudless day with, with the brightest light possible. I think we were in July, maybe. And um, this is because um, a, something funny happens with our brain and light. Uh, it's not that this glass lets all the light through. In fact, it cuts down 80% of the daylight. It really is a strong, it's like a pair of really strong sunglasses. Still, when the sun is shining right into it, the light is very bright. And it's actually a very uh, pleasant effect for our brain. We're processing uh, this brightness. Our eyes are working exactly where they like to be without being blighted by the intensity, but um, with the full quality of the daylight. If the sun, um, if the sky is covered, if the light level outside drops, it drops it drops even more inside, but it stays at the same, uh, the sky has the same color if you want. Uh, it looks like um, a strongly lit hallway in, um, in a hospital with bright fluorescent light. It's, uh, you, you've, you've had that feeling. It's extremely unpleasant. It's the kind of light that you get. It's deeply filtered daylight, which our eye is not naturally able to process. It's extremely depressing. It looks like you're in a hospital corridor or inside um, a tomb. So that's why I chose the, the weather report uh, day that was supposed to be favorable. And then Philippe's assistant calls us and says, we need to reschedule. And I say, what day? And she says, oh, um, next Monday. Is that OK? Well, if that's the only day. And I checked the weather report. And it turned out to be a, a completely 100% covered day. The meeting was at 10.30 in the morning. We go in there. Philippe comes up and says to us, so you like to look at art in a tomb? <laughs> and uh, so it was a tough meeting, um, as always, but trying to, uh, with a ping pong of uh, opinions and recommendations. In the end, he agreed that we had to put some more curtains in the place, but uh, we all left it feeling uh, a little bit worse rather than better. <laughs> but we still, we're still working here, so. <laughs> and, 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 and that's really all for science today.
Thank you. We have just a few minutes if anyone wants to go to either of the microphones and ask a question or two before you leave or leave now if you need to. Yes, sir. May I? Yes. Uh, firstly, I wish to thank you. I'm most appreciative of uh, what you did collectively in your fields of uh, endeavor, and I thank you very much for that. It was a masterful presentation. Secondly, I wish you would indulge me two-part question. Number one, how do you increase your already extensive knowledge which, within your field of conservator, uh, conservatorship? And secondly, when you conclude an agreement with another uh, museum, wherever that may be, how do you secure the shipment of the items they're sending? How do you secure them? How do you ship them? How do you uh, agree to portray them here, display them here? and then return them again. I can answer the first part. In terms of that knowledge, we're um, constantly looking at things. I think that came up in the film. We're just, just simply looking at everything you could find. We examine things under the microscope. All of us do on a regular basis. And I think we exchange a lot of information with our colleagues, do a lot of reading of research that's been published. As far as the shipment is concerned, we probably all have comments about that, but we do investigate that very carefully also. And we have a registrar's department uh, where the, the members of that department are very well informed as to um, recent um, research on issues. Marco, you said you were hiring somebody who is a specialist in vibrations. That's an extremely important aspect of um, shipping works of art. Knowing what materials to pack them with, we always investigate the, in some cases, acid-free materials or materials that have a certain amount of shock absorption. Every type of object has different requirements, and very frequently a conservator will accompany a work of art just because it is known to be fragile in um, every aspect of the, um, the, the, uh, the trip has to be supervised as well as the unpacking and repacking. Is the means of conveyance always by sea? No. No. By air sometimes? It's almost always by air now. That's or considered truck. safer. Is that right? How do you do the very large pieces? Then? You and get very heavy? large airplanes. Um, no, no, I mean, that's what you do. You, fly, you uh, truck things. We trucked from Ukraine to Frankfurt. Right. And, and then flew to the United States Thank for large much. things I borrowed. Thank you. Thank you. What, yes? What is the history of the Valentine painting? Where did it come from? It was... Is that working now? Um, I, I don't have the details with me at the moment, but it, it was historically in Cardinal Mazarin's collection. It had been with the French family for many years. Um, the French government gave it an export license. Um, that's how we were, were able to bring it here to look at um, prior to acquisition. But it had been with the, very, the same family for many, many, many generations. But I'm sorry I don't have the, the exact details of the provenance at Thank hand. You. Uh, thanks very much for a wonderful discussion. Uh, my question back goes back to, again, authenticity and uh, attribution and copy of the paintings. Um, I know what's discussed and happens at every museum regarding different paintings. How you, how you reach the decision, uh, like this painting is authentic, and other experts, your colleagues from other museums, disagree with you? Like, for instance, a few years ago, we had George de Latour here, or Rembrandt discussions. So how you reach to the decision that versus the others, um, or vice versa? You mean on a particular acquisition? Right. Um, it, it very much varies according to the object. I mean, with the Valentin, which I was using as an example there, um, there was no question among uh, all the leading experts in the field who painted this. It was an absolute signature picture. It had been engraved. Um, if, if an object came up where there was um, disagreement, um, really it's just sort of a case of due diligence of contacting um, both from the conservation side but also um, very much from the curatorial side, uh, other specialists and experts, hearing their opinion, um, getting as much discussion and information as possible. But then at a certain point, um, it comes down to the museum to decide whether they feel, based on the recommendations of the curator, that they, for example, if an object, some people may not, you know, something might be 
uh, where someone is questioning whether it's, uh, there's more workshop than the actual artist. In the end, the museum rightly looks to its own curatorial staff after they've sought out a lot of, um, dis a lot of other advice to make a final decision one way or the other. Yeah, thanks very much. Somebody has music. <laughs> yes, sir. I, I wonder how large the staffs of your respective departments are and how it, that compares with other leading museums around the world. Big. <laughs> yeah. Um, I have five full-time uh, conservators on my staff, but I also have two part-time people and uh, fellows in the department. And on occasion for a special project, we will be able to hire someone who's an expert, such as these small miniatures. Uh, there are people who we do not have in the museum, but are known to be experts, so we'll hire them. And I think every department, it just varies, often depending upon the project. But they're not big departments, and we have a huge amount of work in, in each department, but uh, well, it gets done. <laughs> we have a forum of curators, conservators, and scientists that represent curators like me, and their departments, and it comes to about 180 members. So we are a, a museum that is very well endowed with both curators and conservators, and it's one of the, the great things about the museum. And then we also, in various ways, publish our research, uh, some online publications. Marco has just started a publication. We try to make sure that what we learn is accessible to other places also, and to exchange uh, scientists and conservators and curators between institutions for study periods. I think Dick has the largest department, don't you? How many are in yes, objects we, conservation? Well, objects conservation is sort of a grab bag department because we do everything but easel painting, textiles, and paper. So everything else winds up with us with a few exceptions like arms and armor and Far East and painting. So we have had including full-time staff members and uh, contractual members, fellows, interns, a whole variety of academic people. We've had as many as 70 odd people. So it is, it is quite a busy place. Thanks for a really interesting inside look behind uh, the paintings and the objects we usually don't get to see. Uh, the thrust of this program was more about conservation and, uh, as a, a handmaiden of acquisitions, but I'm interested in finding out as we uh, have fewer funds to make acquisitions in the next several years, maybe decade, uh, how much of your attention is really going to be uh, put into the less perhaps sexy area of conserving what we already have, and how do you make choices about what you do to um, put those resources into the existing collection. I, I mean, I, I'll just kick off because I think one of the things when we do a, an afternoon like this is it is very focused on one aspect. And new acquisitions and the amount of, of work represented um, on shown today is a fraction of our day-to-day -day work, and the most of the day-to-day -day work is completely to do with the permanent collection, with the m making sure that the permanent collection is in as best condition as we can, making sure that if we're um, sending out works on loan, that they're in a suitable condition to be lent, that they're packed properly, um, that works coming in um, are looked after properly. All of that is really the day-to-day -day work, and acquisitions take up a very small part of it. Um, that is the case. Actually, if we, the big problem is we always complain that we don't have enough time to look after the permanent collection. I mean, depending how do you count it, we have two million objects, and that requires an awful lot of conservatist time yeah. to be looked after continuously and properly. So it's an opportunity for us to go back and take a very good look at what we have not only on display, but in the storerooms. In terms of where we're setting priorities, wherever we have new galleries, we've just done new Byzantine galleries, new early medieval galleries. Um, Dick's Objects Conservation Department had to put a, a great deal of its staff to help get those galleries ready. And there will always be a sequencing of what is 
going to be on display first, what is very interesting research of things in storage. We're going through textiles from uh, Egypt under Byzantine rule now and trying to see which ones we would want to study further and which ones we'd want to have framed for display. I think every curatorial department and every conservation department has its own mental list of where they would turn their attention the moment they got it. Could I also ask, um, uh, I know there's a trend in museums to make storage visible. And, you know, I found the exhibit upstairs in tribute to Philippe dazzling, but that's a very small part of the 80 some odd thousand, is that correct? 80 or 18,000? 84, but a lot of that is paid. A lot of that is actually going on display as archives for the photographs but department, so you get it on the web. I was wondering if in the future, because space is, is a fraction of what it could be it's for, uh, needed for display, if, if the museum is going to go for uh, some of this visible storage uh, approach that other museums have been well, looking we do, at. We, do, we, we have it many yeah. places. In the Egyptian department, the American department, works on paper and textiles cannot be kept on view for more than a three month period per year. And generally, we like them not to go on view every year. But what many people are not aware of is that one can make an appointment in the print and drawing study room to look at anything at any time. So um, they are accessible to the public, and the public is welcome to, to look at these things. Our entire Egyptian department is on display. We, we, it was conceived of and has been for several decades in open storage in essence, and the American wing, which will reopen in May, has the loose center, which is more, I think, what you're thinking of. It's glass wall and things behind it. it the problem, as, as, as was just described, is you can't put a lot of things on display and not have them damaged. Uh, the European Sculpture and Decorative Arts Department is doing more and more rotations in their small gallery. So right now we have ceramics or theirs. Everybody knows this is a problem, and one way we're trying to solve it, which is not the actual object, is to put more and more on the web of all of our collections and make it accessible so that you could search what you were interested in, and then every department in one way or another allows people who have research interests to come and look at the works that are related to what they want. It's not so nice when a graduate student writes and says, I'm doing this topic, please tell me everything you have and give me all the information and I will turn it into a paper. But <laughs> when they put a little more effort into it, it's very interesting to have them. But one have, more question? I just oh. want to add one thing, that not everybody who comes in is interested in research when it comes to prints and drawings. We have many artists who come in who want to copy or Michelangelo or what other drawings we have. So we are very accepting and welcoming of those people as well. Is there one last question? Thank you very much for coming today.